three times. That's how many times I've rewritten this video essay. To say the least, this video turned into so much more than I had expected it to be. Rather than me explaining why I thought Letterkenny was a masterpiece, I wanted to give everyone who clicked on this video the ability to revisit the road taken so far. I didn't want this to just be another gloss over video where I wouldn't look at the show as a whole. I wanted to relive it. I wanted to see how all of the characters had grown through the seasons. So with that, let's begin. Let's start with season one, episode one. Letterkenny achieves a unique feat with me that not a lot of shows do. They're able to get me fully invested in the show only in the first few minutes. And you really can't talk about Letterkenny without talking about the code openings and their first one definitely does not disappoint. Character introductions are a difficult obstacle for some writers to accomplish and that's for one obvious reason. You don't want to overwhelm your audience too early on in the story. This is why in most traditional television shows, you're introduced to only a handful of characters in small doses. However, for Letterkenny, it's almost like you free fell into a story that was already in motion, and now the show is telling you, well, now that you're here, try and keep up. In just a code opening, you're introduced to five total characters. Wayne, Derry, Katie, Riley, and Jonesy. And in that span of seeing all these new people for the first time, you can already tell how different everyone was before getting into the actual episode itself. You had Wayne, a stern, confident, and composed, monotone talking hick who is clearly protective of his sister, who we'll get to in a second. You had his friend Derry, who to me at this point so early on in the story was a carefree, go-with-the-flow type character. And then yes, you had Katie, Wayne's younger sister who, like her older brother, was also confident, but more adventurous and experimental, and was openly seeing not one, but two stereotypically hot, dumb jocks. And then you had Riley and Jonesy. There isn't much to say about them, or from what I could find, um, much to say about them as their own separate person, but together they appear to be more of the trolls of the show who will mainly be used for comedic relief. I was able to gather all this information from just one cold opening. We haven't even gotten to the episode itself yet. That's how well the writers Jared Kiso and Jacob Tierney were able to establish these characters so early on. But the cold opening does also give us a very key detail that unlocks what the episode is actually going to be about. We learn that Wayne is not his usual self and it's due to a recent breakup with his now ex-girlfriend Angie who he'd been in a five year relationship with. The writers also tell us one important fact. Angie changed Wayne. Wayne was a scrapper, but put that life on pause just for Angie's sake. Real ouchy, bro. It's too bad she taught you not to fight anymore, buddy, because that's a fight on sight for you and her new guy, buddy. All in the span of 2 minutes and 22 seconds, we learn all of this. But let's get into the actual episode itself. We learn it's actually been a month since the breakup, and Derry and Katie are realizing that Wayne is still very well stuck in his run. So once Katie has Wayne alone, she introduces him to Tinder and hopes he'll find someone new to take his mind off of Angie. Before we're able to actually see him use it, they're interrupted by Riley and Jonesy pulling up in the driveway, and I want to highlight this moment just because of what happens next. We see Wayne smile before he turns away from the camera. Remember this because we will not see this often. This moment makes it even more special considering that the person who made him smile was his sister. In the next scene we meet another close friend, Dan aka Squirrely Dan. We see pretty early that he has a sweet spot for Katie and Wayne does not approve. But apart from this, we're also able to see who the storyteller of the group is, and oh my god, are his stories good. We're then taken to Modine's for Thirsty Thursday drinks, where Katie asks a precautionary... Is Angie working? Reminding us that even after a month, knowing her whereabouts to make sure Wayne doesn't see her is still a high priority. Once the coast is clear, we're finally introduced to personally one of my favorite characters when she's on screen, and that's our favorite hypersexual Gail. And then, not even two minutes later, when Wayne goes to have a piss, we are introduced to McMurray, who also confirms that he's seen Angie's new boyfriend. 
this was the point when I realized that this show was going to have a lot of characters involved. We also meet a secondary character, Alexander, who plays a role in why Wayne snaps back to his old self, but we'll get to that in a second. Once Wayne gets back from the bathroom, Gail tries to make her move to be Wayne's rebound and Daryl invites him to youth group. Surprisingly, he says yes to Daryl, and oh boy, more character introductions incoming. At the same time that Wayne makes it to the youth group with Derry, we're introduced to the Skids, the emo druggies of Letterkenny, for a couple of seconds before transitioning back to Wayne. We see that he's super uncomfortable with this whole youth group thing going on, and that's when we see our next recurring character, Glenn. At this point of the episode, he's introducing us to his beautiful beard, Virginia, who he totally loves so much and so for real. Is anyone saying, where is my beautiful girlfriend, Virginia? Jenny, where are you? Oh, ugh, Jenny. Jenny, Jenny, Jenny. Mm. I still remember, like it was yesterday, the day that the Lord gave you to me. And he said, this is your blank canvas. It is pale. It is colorless. It is almost cardboard-like. I want you to give it life, to give it color. And I said to the Lord, I will give it everything, everything, except for one thing, vaginal intercourse. <laughs> And I think at this point, we're all thinking what Wayne's thinking. What the actual fuck is this place? Wayne later goes out for a smoke, and during that time, we're formally introduced to the skids. The main three who we get to know, since they're the only ones that actually have lines, are Stuart, Glenn, and Devin. Alright, so I will be honest. At this point in the show, the skids were a little bit too much for me. But I did have to remind myself that Little Kenny was only 13 minutes old and they had to paint a clear picture on what the skids were all about. But yes, these characters were more annoying than they were funny. <laughs> like, I guess like how actual meth heads are. So looking back now, I see why they were portrayed this way. But during that time, oh my god. Anyway, as Wayne finishes his smoke and leads the skids outside to rejoin the youth group, Wayne notices something, and that's that basically all the guys there besides him and Gary were all gay and casually surfing Grinder. As everything begins to settle down, all the characters that we met so far are all at Modine's for the final scene, and I'm glad that they actually did this. It's a good way to confirm to us, the audience, that all the characters we were introduced to weren't just throwaways that we can forget. Up to this point, Wayne has been good. He's been composed and patient, but he's slowly reaching his breaking point. The skids are making fun of Wayne after they caught him earlier googling what Grinder was after Margaret told him that Tinder originated from it. As they continue to try to publicly humiliate him, Riley and Jonesy overhears what's happening and also joins in. And after probably thinking that things couldn't get any worse, Angie's new boyfriend walks in. All the built up stress causes Wayne to go out for another smoke and conveniently enough, Katie's parked outside having a drink and also a smoke in her truck and this is where my favorite part of the episode happens. Wayne, you remember when you were 19, those worm pickers kept coming in the night and trampling on our beans? What'd you do? Dog six foot holes, put a skunk in each one and waited for him to fall in. Remember when the skids egged Daryl on his bike? What'd you do? Put stink bombs in a Nerf gun and fired it at him on prom night. Remember when you came in from Choran and found those messages on my computer from a guy calling me a slut? I wanted a piece of that guy for a long time. He drove over to his house and broke his nose on his front lawn. <laughs> you know, I miss that, Wayne. I think a lot of people do. It's for the better. We get a small taste of who Wayne used to be, and Katie finally tells him, I miss that Wayne. Then the final gears of the episode start to spin. A drunk Alexander, the guy who was in the bathroom with Wayne and McMurray earlier in the episode, goes outside to take a piss. Troy, Angie's new boyfriend, also decides to come outside and sees that Alexander is peeing on a pile of trash. So he takes out his phone and begins to record. Troy then approaches him from behind and Sparta kicks him on top of the trash and laughs. This was Wayne's final straw. His limit of patience has been reached and the old Wayne slowly begins to resurface. 
Wayne confronts Troy, but in doing so, it only pushes him further towards the edge. Troy brings up how easily he was able to take Angie from him, but then he takes it too far once he brings up possibly doing the same to Katie this time, and just like that... The elevator opens for no one And plans are making me we get our first litter Kenny scrap. Come this far. And plants are making me. Everyone looks like everyone. Just like snowflakes were already now. Just too busy to accept it. The final scene of the episode is a short one, but it speaks for itself. As Riley and Jonesy drop off Katie, we see that they refrain from saying anything that would set Wayne off. So instead, Jonesy just waves. And as they start the car and back out of the driveway, we are given a good farewell sight. Good to have you back, big brother. Bye Wayne. Bye Wayne. Have a good one, bro. Wayne's back. Without wasting any time, let's jump into the next episode. Daryl's Super Soft Birthday Party. This one's a good one. The episode starts with the super awkward Daryl just now walking in a frame where we see Wayne, Katie, and Dan just hanging out on the porch. As he stands there reluctantly, head down, not sure how to approach whatever matter he's about to talk about, Katie tells us a little fun fact about ninth grade Derry. Dan, do you know that Daryl used to get boners every morning in grade nine during O Canada? No shit. Yep, just could not get through O Canada without getting a boner. Give a young man 30 idle seconds and he's gonna get a boner. We talked about this. Is there something you wanna talk about now? After that and a little pitter-patter push from Wayne, we get to know what's making Derry so uncomfortable. I was wondering if this year we could skip the birthday party. Skip your super soft birthday party? Are you fucking high? Hard no. Immediately after hearing Daryl's request, we see how quickly Wayne and Katie in particular react. His birthday parties were especially named Derry's Super Soft Birthday Party. And this was because his mom would always throw him these horrid peace of the world type parties. They were more meant to uplift and inspire rather than just be a fun kid's birthday party. This is also when we get a very important and key rule that both Katie and Wayne stand by that pushes the party forward. Party's happening, Daryl. You don't fuck with tradition. The next scene is an important development piece for Wayne. Now that he's back to his fighting ways after what happened in episode 1 with Troy, he's now looking to reclaim the title of being the toughest guy in Litter Kenny by going against other guys around town who also claim that accolade. Wayne's plan is simple. Beat them all. <laughs> so this isn't a key plot to the actual episode, but I wanted to bring it up because it's absolutely hilarious and we see how well educated that basically everyone is about the male anatomy. I'd want to put a mirror down there, see what's what. One time, my cousin, he tore open his ball sack trying to do a skateboard trick, and he had to show it to his mom. Was it his scrotal sack? Well, you know, that dangly piece of flesh, what hangs down behind the penis. Scrotal sack. The nut sack. So he tore his ball sack open trying to do a skateboard trick, and he's got to show it to his mom because apparently one of his testicles is showing. Was it the right one or the left one? Why is that of importance? Well, because the left one has more sperm in it. Spermatozoa is what it's called. Tell you what, if I ripped open my ball sack trying to do a skateboard trick, I'd be more worried about seeing my vas deferens. Well, you'd have to tear your ball sack pert near wide open doing a skateboard trick if you wanted to see your own vas deferens. I'm not sure I want to see my own vas deferens. I think if I saw my own vas deferens, I'd be quite worried. I'd be most worried if I tore my ball sack open trying to do a skateboard trick if I could see my accessory glands. Well, you don't want to go too kooky with accessories on your truck. Or your Jeep. It's okay with like a quad though, like my buddy Big T's got a snorkel kit on his nuts, pretty punk rock. What's an accessory gland? Well, if your vas deferens is your sperm ducts, the accessory glands is what supplies lubricant to the sperm duct. I think if I ripped open my ball sack trying to do a skateboard trick, 
I'd be most worried about seeing my seminal vesicles. Oh, like the Florida State seminal vesicles? Like the sac that hangs behind your vas deferens. It contains fructose, which is energy for the sperm. Yeah, it's like when you go in the city there and they got them charge stations for the people what drive the electric cars. That's pretty much your seminal vesicles. I thought it was pretty funny when I said Florida State seminal vesicles and nobody laughed. Hello. It's finally time for Wayne's first fight against a guy named Slut Ted on his road to regaining the title of the toughest guy in Litter Kitty. The fight didn't last long and it ended up being pretty one-sided with Wayne not taking a single hit. Now's a good chance for me to mention how good the song choices are for this show. I never would have thought I would hear a song like You Got It by The Chains of Love during a fight scene. You would think the songs wouldn't fit the mood, but for some oddly satisfying reason, it just feels like it's in place. The same can be said for the follow-up transition shot, where Katie hops out of her truck and walks into what I assume to be a convenience store, and we see the skids crazy dancing to Treat Me Right by Keys and Crates. Also in that 30 second transition, we get to see Stuart's clear infatuation with Katie that teases a very interesting character plot point that we might get to see in future episodes. So as we wait for Wayne's next opponent, the preparation for Daryl's super self birthday party continues. Katie mentions to Wayne that their neighbor wouldn't be giving them a horse this time because last year it came back smelling like alcohol. As a substitute, he offers his donkey, but Wayne swiftly declines, and we hear the reminder that was said earlier in the episode. Oh. Said that he's gonna give us a donkey? Nope. Might be funny. Gotta be a horse, you don't fuck with tradition. Hello? Okay. End of the laneway, don't come up the property. Good. Is here. And now it's time for the next brawl with the guy they call Radass. Fight wise, he did better than Sled Ted, meaning he actually got a hit in, before it turned completely one sided in Wayne's favor. Once Radass is down for the count, we also get to see that legendary back acne that Derry mentioned earlier in the episode. We see that Katie recruited Riley and Jonesy to help out with Derry's super self birthday party. They were given the assignment of going on a liquor run to retrieve all the alcohol on the list, but they ran into one issue. Uh, there's ingredients that I don't think you can get in Letterkenny. Yeah. So go to the city. This was when I got the feeling that this party was more important to Wayne and Katie than I had originally thought. I knew they cared for Daryl, obviously, but the lengths Katie and Wayne were willing to go to to make sure the party was perfect showed how much this meant to them personally for some reason. I mean, we're more than halfway through the episode and Derry hasn't even mentioned his birthday once. Honestly, I had completely forgotten that it was his birthday that they were celebrating. So after sending Riley and Jonesy away, Katie gets a text from Stuart about how he saw her in town earlier. This is just another hint of Stuart's clear interest in Katie. So tell me about this guy, Joint Boy. Well, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you, Wayne. This guy looks like an Australian rugby player chiseled out of stones. Uh-oh. How come I'd never heard of him before? Oh, he just got out of jail. He was arrested for assault after he beats the shits out of a guy for pushing up on his sister. You think we should call the ginger? Hmm. No. Derry asks why, and that's when we hear the first widespread rumor of Letterkenny. Like you heard he fucked an ostrich, right? He what? He fucked an ostrich. Allegedly. How does a fella get caught up in that sort of business? Well, I guess his cousin 
had an ostrich farm when he thought it might be fun to fuck one. Allegedly. So he got hard, but somehow, when he fucked an ostrich. That's fucked. That's a felony. So we use them in emergencies only then? I should say. It's finally time for Derry's super soft birthday party and it actually looks really cool. And despite the complications Katie faced earlier in the episode, she was still somehow able to work everything out. So the party was going great and as planned, then Joint Boy and his buddies show up to meet with Wayne to see who between the final two of them will hold the title of the toughest guy in Litter Kenny. Now, this is probably seen as a little thing, but I love it, so I'm going to bring it up anyway. Since Katie worked so hard on this party, Wayne actually asks her for permission to proceed, and she says, Goddamn right you may. Thank you. You don't lose. I just wanted to bring this part up because I love Wayne's clear and constant show of respect for his sister. As they continue, we learn an interesting fact about Joint Boy, and that's that Alexander is his second cousin. Joint Boy considers what Wayne did as a favor and offers a handshake instead of a fight, and Wayne looks back at Katie for her advisement. Again, I absolutely love the respect for Katie. He even lets her decide on whether they should fight or just shake hands. And what's Katie's final verdict? After that, Wayne simply says, I didn't do you no favors. So I don't know who the fuck you are. And just like that, it's time to settle it. Let me tell you, compared to the other fights we saw previously, this one takes the whole cake. For a little bit, I didn't even know who was going to win because of the constant trade of blows. But in the end... Once it's settled, Wayne invites Joy Boy and his crew to the party and everything's chill again. We pan over to Dan and Derry sitting alone and get some very important information. Listen to this. Oh, it's really more for them, ain't it? What is? All this. No, it's not. It's cream cheese. No. That's cream cheese. No. Yeah, that's cream cheese. Let's go. Jesus. You remember they weren't allowed to have birthday parties growing up. They had to go Bucky at mine. Well, they dudes go all out, don't they? It's a Texas size 10 4. Yeah. We learned that Katie and Wayne weren't allowed to have birthday parties growing up. And they were, whether they realized it or not, living their missed out childhood through Derry since his birthday was the only time they could experience a party. Since there are no parents in the show, you don't really get to see the reason why the characters are the way they are. You only really get to see the aftermath. The last key thing we see in this episode is Katie texting Stuart again after he asks her out to get ice cream where she replies, can't tonight, hinting that she might actually be interested in Stuart and that something is brewing with those two. But let's not get off topic and talk about possible future endeavors down the letter Kenny timeline. This episode we were able to settle one thing. That's the toughest guy in letter Kenny. <laughs> All right, uh, this one was a <laughs> this one was a weird one. So if you want to know the what the whole episode is about, then just listen to this one sentence. It'd be kind of neat if you could like catalog your farts. I'm gonna be honest. Out of all of the episodes so far, I think this one is hands down my least favorite. So be warned. I'm about to go through this one really quick. So basically the crew comes up with an idea of social platform revolving around hearing, rating, and appreciating others' farts. So after they come up with the idea, they now find someone who can build the website. Turns out Letterkenny's internet guru is Stuart, but Wayne is hesitant, so to say the least, he doesn't want him involved. Squirrely Dan puts it to a vote and the result comes back to one in favor of requesting Stuart's assistance. 
Time passes and Stuart and Devin meet up with Wayne, Dan, and Derry to come up with a plan for the site and to also negotiate a 30% cut for any profits the site might make. Though it sounds like they have no intention of using Fartbug for monetary gain. After everything is discussed, Stuart says, Give us 24 hours. And what do you know, 24 hours later, they have a functional site. And so I won't awkwardly have to, I'll let Stuart explain the site. Each member will be able to upload three farts. Each member will post a picture to their farts. Members will then be allowed to friend request each other and accumulate audiences for their farts. After Stuart is done showcasing the site and sets up Dan for his test account, they move on to the next phase getting outside feedback. Wayne recommends Gail and Daryl recommends the ginger and his friend Boots. And this is where we get to learn more about the ostrich rumor. You guys ever hear anything about that guy fucking an ostrich? No, I, I heard it was Boots who fucked the ostrich. No, the ginger fucked an ostrich. Allegedly. But see, it'd take more than one guy to fuck an ostrich. You think they were both there? Like Boots held down the ostrich? I suppose if we really wanted to get to the bottom of it, we could find someone, someone who farms ostriches, who might know how they get fucked. So after the unanimous decision to not involve Ginger or Boots, they settle on inviting the hockey players, Glenn and his band of Christians, and also, more most importantly, for the sake of Stuart's story, he recommends Katie. All things considered, everything seems to be going well, but Stuart runs into a couple of problems. The first one being Gail and her spam chain posts, and the other being about ours truly, Katie. She's been posting near hourly cat farts rather than her own. Before everyone is able to continue the conversation, Riley and Jonesy pull in to confront Katie about how she's been liking all of Stewart's farts on Fartbook and not a single one of theirs. And then to the final problem, Glenn. <laughs> he hasn't posted anything to his profile, but has added everyone except for Wayne. He's also been interacting with everyone's posts despite not contributing personally. So after Stewart warns Glenn that if he doesn't start contributing, he'll suspend his profile, Wayne later expresses his want to put an end to Fartbook because of people's misuse. Stuart and Devin both disagree with Fartbook's closing and Devin threatens to sue Wayne for everything he's got if they try to close it. And then this happens. I, I don't know what happened just now. Just when we begin to think everything is settled, Devin and Stuart breaks the news that Glenn stole the website and oh shit. We learn that Glenn created his own rivaling site called Christian Fart Mingle. They come to realize that Glenn's website was more innovative and that there were many more websites before Fartbook and decided to let go of the grudges against Glenn's website. Come near the end of the episode, we learn that the reason why Wayne never made an account on Fartbook was because he didn't like the idea of farting in front of women. For the ending scene of the episode, we see Stuart staring at Katie's Farbook profile and him replaying her last post over and over, showing us that he misses her already. Cold opening, short and simple. Danny and Derry are looking to get laid. But moving on into the opening scene of the episode, we see how good Jonesy and Riley are at chirping and how much they actually get into their opponent's head. After they're done chirping, they look back in the crowd and they get a little bothered by the fact that Katie stopped coming to their games. I think this is the first actual look at Katie's attempt of distancing herself from Riley and Jonesy. 
And at this realization, we move from those two to see what Katie's actually doing. She's with Wayne, Daryl, and Dan discussing Buck Hunter season, referring to all the new college students that will be around at Modine's. When Katie asks if they plan on actually wearing belts, Dan asks why they don't in the first place. We finally get the answer that even I was wondering all the way back when watching episode one. Because we buy pants that fucking fit. Why would I buy a piece of leather that costs $25 when I have a perfectly good skate lace at home? $25, no. Fucking 25? You're lucky to have a $25 belt. Fuck, you've been to winners lately? You're talking about $35, $45. So after the belt explanation, we go back to Riley and Jonesy where we hear that they're on a 10 law streak. When Katie meets the two outside, they ask why she doesn't come to their games anymore, and we get our answer. Because you're dog shit? We're not dog shit. I mean, the boys are dog shit, but I mean, we're, we're pretty good. Is that why they always play and you guys never do? She might be onto something there, bro. I'm not seeing a whole lot of special teams time, buddy. Yeah, we kill the penalty all year. I mean, we want to score goals, but we just end up killing him, boys. Mm -hmm. Katie agrees to come watch them play if they are actually put into the game, and this was the motivation they needed to talk to the coach about putting them in. So this is where I finally got interested in Riley and Jonesy as characters. They now had a clear goal to shoot for. This was their chance to actually transform themselves into actual athletes rather than bench warmers. So they speak to their coach and he tells them to get into shape and study their past games. Now that Riley and Jonesy are properly motivated, it's now time to follow the nightlife of Letterkenny, especially with all the new college phases in town. So finally at a packed Modine's, Wayne, Daryl, and Dan are sitting at the bar top talking with Gail, and we finally hear another development of the ostrich rumor. Guys ever hear anything about that guy fucking an ostrich? No, the ginger fucked an ostrich. God, I love this continuous side plot. Allegedly. It would take more than one guy to fuck an ostrich. We've heard that it was a sick ostrich. Well, it would take two guys to fuck an ostrich. Even. Again, we're hearing it was a sick ostrich. Still, it's a three-man job to fuck one. This is a nice way to show how small Letter Kenny actually is and how fast rumors can travel. You see that everyone knows everyone and that people talk a lot. Next up, we have a quick just ripping sesh with Riley and Jonesy in the shower where they go over the types of workouts that they're going to be doing to get into shape. We get introduced to an upside down back towards the camera as washing Shorzy that I can't show because uh, everyone's naked. Night 2 opens up with Wayne being a McMurray at a deer hunting arcade game and just like the last time we saw McMurray, he brings up Angie and her boyfriend who upgraded his car and goes into deep detail on what he actually wore. Honestly, when I first watched this scene, I thought this was going to be the writer setting up Wayne vs. Troy Part 2. But surprisingly, that didn't happen. Later on, Dan finds a girl that he likes and Wayne assures him, like he did with Derry earlier, that the girl likes him back and encourages him to go talk to her. At this point halfway through the episode, it should be clear that Wayne is perfectly fine helping others find their matches, but when it comes to finding what he wants, he doesn't try. The next day rolls around and Katie visits Riley and Jonesy. She sees them failing to stick to their new diet, but also that they're trying, so she stays with them to watch them do their cardio session. After the workout is over, they ask her the question again. So, we got in shape and studied the tape. You gonna come watch us play with intensity tomorrow? Yeah, I could do that. Wheel snipe, Sally, boys. Dude, fucking dangles, boys. Ninja dust. <laughs> If you haven't noticed, Katie is in a hell of a predicament. With this current relationship she has with Riley and Jonesy, as well as the sprouting connection she's getting with Stuart, I found myself getting stressed for her. And just like that, night three is upon us. Wayne is hit on by a really attractive brunette and he finally takes his first steps to getting over Angie. The brunette signals Wayne to meet her in the washroom and Wayne is totally into it. He seems to finally be over Angie and ready to move forward. until he's not.
And just like that, Wayne is back where he started. A fucking rocket, boys. Holy fuck, boys. Whose billet sister's a fucking rocket? Katie kept her word in a Tina Riley and Jonesy's hockey game. One problem, though. They don't like the way the other guys talk and gawk at her when she's around. Katie meets back up with her brother, Squirrely Dan and Derry, when Riley and Jonesy show up. They tell her that they no longer want her to come to their games because it was too distracting for their teammates, and she turns it around on them. I heard you say that I'm a distraction. Okay. Well, guess I'll have to find one of your teammates who dibs my digits. <laughs> the episode ends with Gil attempting to hook up with Wayne once again due to his inability to hook up with the brunette from last night, and he, uh, declines. Before we go to the next episode, can we all agree that Gil has the best one-liner so far? Where's that rag? There it is. <laughs> Wake up, big shoots, and really big shoots. More hands make less work. Call me cake, and they'll go straight to your ass, cowboy. So before I start, I absolutely have to mention how much I love how Wayne is just casually putting his dog in a headlock while he has him sitting on his lap like a child. But anyway, as we saw in the cold opening, Derry got bit by a possum and in the first scene we're seeing the aftermath. As Wayne nonchalantly throws out jokes, Katie notices that Derry is acting strange then sees the bite on his hand. After Wayne tells her that Derry was bit by a possum, she tells him that she thinks he has rabies. As soon as she says that, Derry throws up and passes out at the kitchen table where Katie tells Wayne one of them needs to take him to the health clinic. They try and quickly decide who it's going to be, but Wayne is unable to due to him having to pick up ice for a jamboree that's being put together. So before Katie leaves with Daryl, we get a little insight of what this jamboree means to Wayne. Turns out that it used to be his and Angie's thing before the breakup. This time around, Wayne plans on using it as a way to find a new girl. So this is huge for us as an audience because we have zero idea what Wayne's type is. We still have yet to even see a glimpse of Angie. For the transition, we get a quick look at what Riley and Jonesy are up to. They're heading out for an away game but are a little on edge since some of their teammates haven't shown up yet. Back to the main story, while Katie is with Derry, we follow Wayne who is now at a gas station getting ice for the Jamboree. This is where we meet the lovely Bonnie who's the cashier that checks out Wayne, in both senses of the word. During their encounter, she makes it abundantly clear that she and many other girls have been interested in dating Wayne for a long time, but had to wait their turn due to his romantic involvement and commitment to Angie. As the conversation ends, Bonnie tells Wayne that the price scanner appears to be broken and lets them take the ice free of charge. We then move on to see what Katie and Daryl are up to. They make it to the clinic and sit on the steps, however, they're not alone. Our good friend Stuart is there too. We see that he's now coming down from all the drugs he's been taking and Katie tells him that what he's doing is no longer charming and he needs to turn his life around. All he really took away from it was that Katie thought he was charming. We also learned that he used to make music that Katie used to actually like enough to steal when she was sneaking to his parties. Before anything else can be said, the nurse arrives and Katie stands up with Derry to head inside. But before she makes it inside, she does confirm one thing. And yeah. You did use to charm me. Wayne makes it back to where the Jamboree is going to be with the ice and runs into McMurray. We see McMurray as a little more serious than usual and that's because his little sister is finally back in town from college. And he wants to throw her hat in the ring since Wayne and Angie are no longer an item. Remember Bonnie? Yeah, that's his little sister. Now that was such a surprise for me given how different they are, but it's definitely an interesting dynamic. The only other siblings we know of at this point are Katie and Wayne, and they're pretty similar. So seeing another pair of siblings who appear to be completely different from one another is a nice change. Wayne and McMurray both seem to be a bit flustered about the conversation and quickly try to change the subject. As they go their separate ways, McMurray does ask Wayne to at least save her a dance. Now we're with the skids, and while Devin and Rold are testing out new meth combinations, Stuart has other plans. He plans on quitting. More specifically, he plans on quitting for Katie. He now aspires to be a superstar DJ and wants to host a rave to prove himself. Why? Well, pick up your fucking phone. McMurray's been trying to reach you all day. <clears throat> 
McMurray. Pleased with yesterday. McMurray calls Wayne to tell him that the Jamboree is now off because Stewart booked up the Ag Hall, where the Jamboree was originally going to be, for his raise. Annoyed Wayne is annoyed, then receives a call from Daryl who needs him to pick him up from the clinic. Daryl expresses his new passion of starting a pest removal business and Wayne quickly jumps on board for his idea and hopes to catch enough pests to release in Stewart's rave. Want to taste, Tannis? <laughs> better watch that bark there, boy, I might get bit. And a new recurring character alert as we jump back on board with Riley, Jonesy, and the rest of the hockey crew. We finally meet Tannis. Tannis notices their shortage of players and says they must have gotten the native flu and also how later can he turn into a meth town. We're back with the skids and we find out Stewart took out $2,000 to reserve the Ag Hall for his rave. Devin calls Stewart to confirm his uh, investment and Stewart says that it's because the rave is going to be a massive production. It's clear that Devin believes he's in over his head and I honestly think we are all thinking that as well. It sucks because at this point in the season I'm really rooting for Stewart. Anyone that wants to turn their life around deserves that chance, but we can't deny that he's definitely biting off more than he can chew here. Wayne, Daryl? Daryl is finally looking better and accompanies Wayne to visit Gail, who's on a juice cleanse and hasn't had alcohol in three days, which is actually impressive since she runs Modine's. Anyway, she called him after hearing about Derry's new pest removal business and needed to remove a skunk, to which they accepted. God, it's unanimous. How are we going to do this? Things are moving fast now as the time for the rave is arriving and Devin takes it upon himself to come up with the plan. And that was to ultimately sabotage Stewart's rave by telling people on Facebook that the Ag Hall has asbestos. Stewart stops by Katie's house to invite her to his rave. For a quick second, we see Wayne carting around the corner of the pests that he and Derry have caught so far. This confirms Wayne's intent on still going through with his plan on releasing them during Stuart's gig. This whole thing makes me really nervous for Stuart now. Especially seeing how he hypes it up for Katie. I mean, look at this. Um, it'll probably be pretty tough to find me through the crowd. Uh, safe security will be pretty tight, but uh, your name's on the guest list, and uh, there's a backstage pass with your name on it. I'll do my best to make it down, Stuart. My ass. And Fucking skids are turning Letter Kenny into a gong show, buddy. Fucking gonger, buddy. I'm rattled about that meth trip, bro. After taking another rough loss, Riley and Josie decide to blame Stuart. This is because of the actively growing meth use that's been going on in Letter Kenny. At this point, everyone is against Stuart except Katie. And honestly, now I have no doubt that this is going to end badly. We cut back to Stuart as he finishes pep talking himself in the mirror and is walking through the stage entrance of the Ag Hall. We finally see the turnout. No one is there except Katie and Bonnie, who is mainly there just for a chance to dance with Wayne. This made me feel terrible. Have you ever gotten that urge to pause something, whether it be a TV show, a movie, or a random video, because it's just so awkward or humiliating to sit through that you actually have to give your brain a break and process what happened? That's exactly what I had to do here. But back to the scene, we see Wayne leave the Ag Hall with his cart full of wild animals after deciding he no longer needs them. At this same time, we see a depressed steward walking off stage and Katie leaving as well. Riley, Jonesy, and the hockey team are now outside the parking lot of the Ag Hall asking Wayne and Derry where Stuart is, and Wayne simply tells them that the rave is canceled. Before things go too far, the hockey coach catches the team out 10 months before curfew and tells them to all go home. 
And now we're left alone with Daryl and Wayne. Just in time for him to receive a call from McMurray to remind him that Bonnie is waiting for a dance and some other, uh, stuff. Stuart arrives back to the skids after his dream is crushed and now he has a new goal in mind. It's... off. We are going to make Letterkenny the biggest meth town in the whole country. I love Stuart! Stuart relapses. And here we are on episode 6, the final episode of season 1. Let's get into it. Wayne finds out someone's been growing marijuana in his backyard, so he is looking to find a way to get rid of it. Ultimately, he decides to look into selling it after Katie says that she knows a guy that can help. Hello, Tannis. Tannis meets with Stuart to sell him cigarettes, but warns him that they're for personal use only. She also says that they'll have a problem when she finds out that they're turning around and reselling them. Despite her warning, they do it anyway, and the scowl she sent out to watch them lets her know. They're fucking us. Katie, Wayne, and Daryl go out to meet the buyer named Wally, who tells them that whoever was growing the marijuana maintained it pretty well and that it would easily sell for $5,000. He goes on to tell them that if they actually pick it for him, he'll buy it off them in cash. Wayne accepts. We also find out that Tannis is his daughter after Daryl finds a picture of her on his wall. He does give them a little warning about her before they leave. Who's this? That's Tannis, my daughter. Should say it's strange, I suppose. What's so strange about her? I'll tell you. If you find yourselves in her way, you ought to swiftly get out of it. Give me a minute. Are you fucked up right now? Me! Yes, you! There's a quick scene with Riley, Jonesy, and team who just learned that their fellow teammate Schmeld is on meth and is blaming the skids. This is when they realize that if the drugs can make it all the way to the new hockey players, then maybe Letterkenny really is a drug town. And this also leads them to the conclusion to confront the skids after not being able to do so in the last episode during the rave. Better buy all the smokes. Tennis lures Stuart and Devin into a back alley after learning they were reselling their cigarettes for a higher price. She tries to make a deal where if they sell the rest of the cigarettes for a buck apiece, they would get a 10-90 split, meaning Tennis would get 90 cents and the skids would get 10. Devin and Stuart decline the offering and Tennis warns them that until they get what they are owed, they'll make everyone in Letterkenny suffer. This isn't just about us anymore, right? This is about everyone now. Your friends, your families. Until we get paid, they all suffer. Mmm, what's our head got nails at that new order? Let's go. Huh? Let the burning of Letter Kenny begin. The warning that we got from Wally about his daughter Tannis is looking like it's about to bite the skids and maybe even all of Letter Kenny pretty soon. Overall, I like the introduction of Tannis. Her not being a Letterkenny local like the rest of the characters gives us the ability to see how people who aren't from Letterkenny react when dealing with situations. We get a quick scene of Katie bringing out lemonade to Wayne, Squirrely Dan, and Derry while they work on building a new produce stand. <laughs> so after not seeing Dan for so long, I do have to admit, it was refreshing to actually hear him finally say this out loud. Is that what you appreciate about me? Oh, easy, Squirrely Dan. Thank you. Your sister's hot, Wayne! There, I said it! I said it! I regret nothing! I REGRET NOTHING! Riley and Josie go to the skids basement hideout with literal see-through stockings over their heads to get payback for turning Litter Kenny into a drug town. But when they peep into the basement window, they see that the place was already hit by someone else. Moving on to Wayne and Katie, they see someone set fire to the produce stand that they were building and to say the least, Wayne is not impressed. 
The next day, Wally meets up with Wayne to pick up the marijuana and tells him that the reason why this happened was because of the beef between the meth heads and his daughter. Predictable, predictable. This little soiree for us. Hey, Mr. Better one of the ag hall last weekend. The hockey players finally get their chance to confront the skids, but while they're arguing, Tennis and her posse shows up to get her money. Stewart says no, and Tennis further threatens to burn Letter Kenny to the ground. But as soon as she starts to turn around to leave, Wayne's there behind her, and he didn't come alone. He also brought the famous ginger and boots. Is that the ginger and boots? Those two guys fucked an ostrich. Just the ginger fucked an ostrich. Allegedly. It would take like two people to fuck an ostrich, three even. It was a sick ostrich. Allegedly. You were fucking ruthless bringing a couple of dudes like that here. In his defense. It's usually not the type of prick I am. If they fucked an ostrich, what else have they fucked? Just the ginger fucked an ostrich. Allegedly. I ask again, if they fucked an ostrich, what else have they fucked? It's almost not worth thinking about. Wayne offers $5,000 for the skids as fuck up and they take it. But before Tennis leaves, after taking Wayne's deal, she goes in on Stuart. I gotta know. This has got to sting a little bit, right? <laughs> I mean, you're short, you're ugly, you're incompetent, you're fucking baroque. Fucking A. <laughs> you're a fucking addict, you're hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you are such a tragedy that even all these people here who hate you will bail you out just so they can, what's the word, erase you. My cousin was born with fetal alcohol syndrome and he works at a fucking bank. What's your fucking excuse? Look at you. You got bloodshot eyes, runny nose, fucking greasy hair, scabs everywhere. What is that? What's that right there? You see that? Is that cum? Dried cum on your fucking zipper? I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, you are pointless. I bet the second you popped out, your mom wished she had a sewn-up snapper. Probably would have been better if you grew to the sickly size inside her womb and killed the both of you before you fucking rolled out and started fucking up. Before Tannis can dig any deeper, Katie comes in to save the day. And then we get our first season finale scrap. And everyone is fighting during the commotion the money is dropped and wayne picks it up brings it back to tannis and safely walks her out of the brawl so after the fight everyone minus tannis's group meets back at modine's for a quick after action report where they all seem to be having a good time again even Stuart, riley and jonesy but before we can call it a day wayne's got to settle something first yeah. Yeah. All right. Who the fuck is the toughest guy in here? That'd be me. And that's it for season one. As far as first seasons go, Letterkenny really kicked off running. It's rare that I can say that a show actually found its footing in the first season, let alone its first season only being six episodes long. I wanted to save this part for last because I really didn't want to take away from what each episode had to offer. Letterkenny is not something you watch for high production value or expansive complex world building. The show and its world are simple and it's easy to latch on to, which can easily make it one of, if not the, most relatable shows that you might have seen so far in modern day television. I've always had difficulty latching on to shows. In most cases, if I can't be pulled in by the end of the first episode, I drop it and never think about it again. To state the obvious, since I'm making a video like this to begin with, Letterkenny wasn't like that. It was different. It was refreshing. I love that the show doesn't take itself seriously. It's fun. 
Before I break on too much of a tangent, for those of you that made it this far, I want to thank you for loving Letter Kenny as much as I do. Since this is my first official video, I'm still trying to find my footing. So please let me know if there are any other TV shows or movie series that you'd like to hear about from me. In the meantime, I will be focusing on parts 2 through 8 for this Letter Kenny video series. Yeah, each video is going to be dedicated to a different season of Letter Kenny. So I don't have an ETA of when the video is going to be out, but I do plan on posting routine updates in a pinned comment below this video for any who are interested. But for now, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.